I was now homeless, living in my Mazda 323, no money whatsoever other than the money that I made from tips, kicked out of a medical program, which I was only three weeks away from graduating. I could not, I was so embarrassed, I was actually thinking of murder. For the first time in my life, the, 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 the demons were beginning to speak to me and they were telling me, vengeance, let's kill those people that said lies about you. And after we kill them, let's kill ourselves. And I was like living in the car, scared, because I'm like, this is not how my mother raised me. And I don't want to harm nobody. But sometimes if you put into a corner and you're bullied and pressure and pressure, pressure, it might drive you to insanity. Johnny Nunez, give it up for Johnny Nunez, power move maker, bring him to the stage. <laughs> oh boy, thank you, Sean. Johnny, typically I start with accolades. Okay. I'm not gonna do that this go round. Okay, okay, okay. Been knowing this gentleman 20 something years, would you say? Yeah, like 22 years. Yeah, at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, always been the same. Great man, extremely humble. Thanks. Take me back to the beginning of your journey, Johnny. Where did it start for you? Um, with photography or? No, oh, in okay. life. Well, um, I was, uh, hmm, okay. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, I was adopted at the age of two by a Puerto Rican family. Uh, grew up in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And then, um, you know, Back then, it was really difficult because I was the only uh, person of color in a predominantly white area. And it was still that time in the 70s where certain neighborhoods you could not walk through if you were this race. And if you went that way, you'd, you'd have uh, what happened to me. Bottles were thrown at me. Rocks were thrown at me. I was called nigger. I was called spick. I was like maybe six, seven years old walking alone. This is when back in the days when your parents would let you walk to school. And I just had no idea what were these words that were being called to me. And um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of fighting, <laughs> a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, I guess you could say racism, but I didn't know what racism was, you know? So I would always tell my mom, you know, whose complexion was different than mine, you know, mommy, like, what, you know, what, what's going on? Why, why do these people uh, say things and why do they throw rocks at me? You know, why do they throw bottles at me? And she's like, you know, don't worry, baby. You know, it, it's okay. Don't worry. We, we just got to finish school here and we're going to go. And we're going to do other things. So, you know, I tried to fit in with my neighbors and some were cool, some weren't. And uh, it was really expressed at an early point in my life. Um, I went to PS34 in Bushwick Greenpoint. Uh, I lived right across from John Erickson uh, High School. And, um, you know, lo and behold, I didn't know the neighborhood I was in was, was saturated in mafia lifestyle. <laughs> and um, uh, unfortunately, my mom and my, my mom who adopted me, Maria Mary Nunez, she unfortunately passed away when I was 10. But the blessing was that her and my father taught me uh, how to pray and taught me the importance of faith in God and how no matter what you're going through, if you have an issue, take it up with the Lord. Uh, I'm a Christian, I don't know what faith everybody's here, but um, my mom made sure, and when I went to sleep, she would pray over me, pray over me in Spanish, pray over me in English, she'd cry and pray, and, and, and I was, as a, as a child, I was always wondering, why is my mom crying? Why is she praying, you know, why is she, uh, she was always teaching me um, things like how to cook, and, uh, She'd always say to me, um, you know, Johnny, learn this now because I'm not going to be here forever. And I would be like, OK, mom, you know, cartoon drawing on, on, on with crayons. And I would always watch my mom cook. And I would always my mom bought me an accordion. 
So I would go to the keyboards. I probably was horrible, but I'm like, mommy, look, I made a song for you. And she would be cooking and I would be playing the keyboard and I, she'd be like, that was amazing. Wanna do another one? I'm like, yeah. And I, you know, <laughs> she gassed me good. So um, unfortunately, when I turned 10, she passed away. Oh, uh, you don't mind what she passed from? She had a stroke. Yeah, and um, it was funny because I remember my, my, my neighbors were telling me, Johnny, uh, you know, go over there. Like, and I was uh, trying to see what was going on as they were taking my mother out. And uh, they were like, Johnny, you know, they were trying to cover my face. And um, I had no idea that would be the last time I saw her. And, um, you know, my dad, we had to live in the same home. So you could just imagine my dad was going crazy. Like, for three years, he was, like, pulling out guns, telling people, no one's going to touch Johnny, I'll kill them, you know. And neighbors... Were, were you the only child? No, I was the youngest. Uh, my, old, my other siblings were older than me. I had a, a sister, Maria, who was the oldest. Paul and Charlie were the second, third. And then my brother, Eddie, he was the baby until I came. Gotcha. So you could imagine the baby hate. <laughs> were were yeah. you the only um, one in the family who was adopted? Yeah, yeah. How did yeah. that work out? Did the family take to you, or was it a little no, bit? No, of... actually, some did, and some told my father the minute my mom passed away, get rid of him. Really? Get rid of him. Put him back in foster care. How'd that ASAP. affect you? I remember hearing some relatives say that, and I was like, oh my God, I hope my dad doesn't put me back, you know? And um, I could remember my dad, if you ever grew up with Puerto Ricans, he let him have it with some, some verbal grammar that I can't <laughs> repeat in this room. And, uh, you know, my dad, unfortunately, my sister, uh, she had an abusive husband. This guy was crazy. Um, women, you know, my sister from being, I hate to say this, but pistol whipping, everything, like beaten, and he was crazy. And he was obviously on drugs too. So my aunt moved from Brooklyn, East New York actually, to Brentwood, Long Island. And growing up in the Puerto Rican family that adopted me, they were so Puerto Rican, they wanted to have chickens and ducks and raise pigs, livestock. You know, I'm talking about like make moonshine and play guitars. Like they were real old school Puerto Rican, carry knives. And um, my, my sister went to hide from her, her ex-husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad, would, you know, my brothers would, after he would, attack, he would, after he attempted to assault my sister, my brothers were looking to kill him. You know, they would actually beat him to the point where they thought they killed him. And he managed to survive. <laughs> I mean, throw, that, throw him over like bridge type of thing. And he would still like come back like the Terminator. <laughs> and, but with more anger towards my sister. And so my aunt said, come to Long Island, hide out for a while. So when my dad went out there to visit her, he was like, you know what, I'm gonna sell this house and just moved to Long Island. And I was 13 years old and I was like, oh my God, where are we going? And my dad's like, listen, it's crack was starting to come into our communities. They were starting to find bodies on the rooftops of buildings. At night, I thought it was firecrackers. I thought I heard like, you know, and I, would, I thought I was like, who's got fireworks? Is it the 4th of July? And it was like bodies. So there was a perfect time for my dad to say, it's time to move to Long Island. So when we moved to Long Island, I was like, oh my God, like, it was one thing to see a lot of white people in, in the part of Brooklyn I was in. It was now, it was like that Long Island white people. What grade were you in? Uh, 13. And I was like, man, dad, like, I was about to go to junior high school. I was going to seventh grade. I, you know, probably had a girlfriend. I was like, I had it all like planned. And then the first day of school at East Junior High, I'm like, man, I, I, I could see lightning bugs in the night and like these spider webs that come out in the night and do off of the trees of leaves. And I would be like, wow, I'm so far in the country. There was like one light pole per several miles. And I was like, Whoa, what is this? It was like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air meets Dracula. You know what I'm saying? Because I was like mortified that there was, n n you could scream and no one's gonna hear you. There's like no lights. So the first day of school, I'll never forget. I go to East Junior High School and I'm like, there's no, culture there's no swag out here i just thought i was like the best break dancer i thought i was like the best rap listener and tape recorder and um all of a sudden some gunshots again Long and, yeah and police telling all the kids evacuate evacuate a, te a disgruntled teacher shot the principal right in the face and took the whole entire cafeteria hostage oh and God. a sniper had to kill him from the window 
So I, was, I remember going to my dad. Were like, you in school that day? Yeah. I was, like, I was like, Dad, you took us out of Brooklyn <laughs> to protect us from being shot. And the first day of school, I come and the principal gets shot in the head. And he got, not only did he get shot, but he took his own blood and put it over his face so that he could disguise himself as dead. So when the gunman came, he kicked him and nudged him with the rifle and he thought he was dead. And he moved on, shooting into classrooms. Wow. Look, so, what year is this, would you say? Let me see. I was born in 1971. That's how ancient I am. And um, probably 82, 83. So, so do me a favor, because this, and, and I love to, to, to hear these early stories, yeah. because it's important for people to know mm -hmm. that just because people find success, they don't always <coughs> come from the best beginnings. No silver spoon. You know, no silver spoon. <laughs> no, and what, what obviously, spoon? <laughs> you didn't have that. No, 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 um, no. Fast forward a little bit. Any college in your in, in your life? Yeah. Oh, so and just and just in that that Go note, ahead. when I went to school, finally, there was a, some dude passing flyers out, mm -hmm. and his name was MC Ugly at the time, and he would go a one two, a one two. I like to introduce myself. It was Biz Marquee. and he went to my school, and then I heard about this. These, these rappers that were about to blow up and make our town big. And it was Eric Sermon and Paris Smith. I was like, oh shoot. And then next door there was a, another MC named Keith Murray. Down the, a few towns over was a guy named Rock Kim, the God MC. And then a few towns down that way was Buster Rhymes and leaders of the new school. Okay, sis, let's stop because I want to I, I come yeah, yeah, back to yeah, this. Yeah, okay, so yeah, you're yeah, jumping right. a little bit yeah, further, no, okay? okay? Sorry. But I'm glad to hear this. Yeah, yeah, no, no, totally. So um, college. Schooling. So, Any college? Yeah, yeah. so. Um, How many when years? I, uh, uh, two years. But when I was in elementary school, they immediately put me in special ed and said that, um, you know, you're, you're very slow and you, you definitely should be put in special classes. So I immediately believed that, wow, I must be really stupid. So um, when I finally got to high school in Long Island, I was one of the fastest and they made me the captain of the East Junior High School track team. So I immediately was undefeated and I wound up getting MVP award. And I was like, wow, man, I wonder if with this trophy, I could actually apply to college. I could say, hey, look, um, I got a trophy and I'm undefeated and I was the captain of the track team. Maybe I can get accepted. And um, my guidance counselor said, I'll never forget it. His name is Mr. Thornton. He said, Johnny, your best bet is to find a woman, get married, get her pregnant and get a job in a warehouse. I was like, Mm, okay, thanks a lot. Really believed in you. And, well, no. Well, it's a joke, Johnny. No, no, no. So, <laughs> so I remember I said, I, said to, I said to God, I said, God, you know, if you could do me one favor, if I could just uh, get accepted to college, I don't care what it takes, you know, in Jesus' name. And uh, I went to Suffolk Community College, I applied, and I got accepted to a liberal arts and general studies class. I wanted to become in, uh, oh, by the way, when I turned 18, I told my dad, Dad, um, I know that um, I know that my mother never wanted to tell me that I was adopted. <laughs> she she had this belief that like every time I would tell her, "Mom, look at my color," you know, she'd be like, "You came out my vagina. Don't ever ask me that question again. <laughs> Just shut the f up," you know, in a nice Puerto Rican way. And um, I'd be like, "Okay." So uh, I told my dad, "Dad, you know, um, it's been years. Do you have any paperwork on on who my mom?" or dad could have been. And my dad's like, you know, I knew this day was gonna come. And he pulled this metal container, opened it and goes, here. And I opened it and the birth certificate said, uh, Borough of Kings Hospital, blah, 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 blah. My mom's name was Neen Soon Diana Chow. And my name was Trevor Allen Innocence Yanis Chow. I was like, what the hell is this? So I would go out to nightclubs and my nephew said, Johnny, you know what? My nephew was about my age because I was born into a family that already had kids. And he goes, you know what we should do? We should call 411 and then ask them if this woman, Dinah Chow, still exists around here. I'm like, the address is so old. It's Barney's now, the, the, the actual home mm -hmm. where she lived. And I said, you know what? I did it and no answer. Oh, excuse me. I, 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 I called 411 and I said, there is one Dinah Chow in the Lower East Side by Chinatown. Uh, we took the bus there, I pressed the button, and the woman's accent was Caribbean. I could not understand a word she was saying. 
And I said, uh, excuse me, my name is Yanis Chow. Would there happen to be a Diana Chow here? My mother screamed, my other siblings, my brothers and sisters screamed, and she said, do you have a birthmark on your foot? So she looked out the, I looked up to the window, I took my shoe off, I'm like, she's like, oh my God. And I finally was rejoined with uh, my Are you still shoe. connected to this? Thing? Yes, to this day. Good relationship? And, yeah, and I found out I was black and Chinese, from Trinidad and Venezuelan. Nice. And I was like, wow, you know, I, you know. So why did I even bring that up? What, 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 not what, sure, but, but it, it, it's some things that I want to, oh, if, if oh, you don't mind, yeah, I, I, yeah, I wanna, yeah. and maybe it'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. You, you know, Johnny, Sorry. you are, are highly successful. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. have been in rooms that so many people dream about yeah. being in. When did you pick up your first camera? Well, I'm gonna make it real quick. After, as I was getting closer to, uh, when I got into college, I became Rain Man. I immediately, grade point average shot up. I was reading books, I was writing, I wrote for the school newspaper. Now that I knew I was black, I, I joined the African, I joined the African American organization, African American association, uh, Latino organization. I began, became a, a Senate member of the student body. And I was like protesting, walk marches. I was doing, I was like Farrakhan meets Malcolm X meets uh, Hector Lavoe, you know? <laughs> and, um, uh, as I was getting close to graduating, there were, one of my friends named Sammy Pizarro, he, his home looked like the White House and he had an in-ground pool. So for me, I was like, man, I wish I could have a double pillar door entrance and an in-ground pool. I felt like that's the ultimate thing. So I asked Sammy, what does your dad do? He was, my dad is a, my dad is a radiologist. He does x-rays, he's, he's a radiologist, x-ray tech. So I was like, oh wow. So as I was getting close to graduating from from uh, Suffolk Community College with a degree in liberal arts, um, I heard that there was a program for radiation therapy at Nassau Community College. And because I volunteered in the soup kitchens, because I was a home health aide, and I loved helping elderly people, I did everything from changing diapers to feeding them to cleaning. I don't know if you guys know what a Foley catheter is. I clean Foley catheters, you name it, poop, everything. I had to, you know, so, but I, but I, but I loved that, that I, I never had a problem doing that. My mom taught me in such a way that I love helping people, so it just came naturally. So when I applied to this program, out of 480 applications, I was one of the lucky 22, based on all the um, involvement with charity, and, and my school grades weren't that bad. So now, here's where photography comes in. <clears throat> As I was uh, three months, three years into this medical program, and three months from graduating, I witnessed something atrocious. I saw a, a woman who was already dying of AIDS, who probably weighed 15 pounds wet. I saw the technicians physically abuse her and laugh while they were hurting her. You know, I'm gonna be honest, the university, the, the radiation department was called, the hospital was called North Shore University. And I was warned before that rotation by other technicians that were white, they were my friends. A girl named Pauline cried. And I said, Pauline, why are you crying? Because Johnny, that hospital is known for racism. And I'm like, I'm a happy-go-lucky guy, everybody loves me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pass through. When I saw what I saw, I was staying at my friend's home and him and his wife let me live on, in their couch. Uh, I had asked them, should I tell the professor? And uh, that's when the magic began. Uh, I reported what I saw. She did, they didn't believe me at first until I told them, ask some of the orderlies of the racial conduct that I saw and sexual harassment that I saw. And it was true. And they were reprimanded, but however, I was ejected from the program. So I went to um, now, uh, at, at the time I actually had a, a small apartment, fast forward, and the landlord told me, Johnny, I'm sorry, but someone wants to rent this room and they're willing to pay more money than you. So uh, the girl I was dating, she was like, Johnny, I've been meaning to tell you, now that you ain't in radiation no more, <laughs> I'm going to Stony Brook and I met a new guy. And so it was almost like, this is great. It was actually awesome because I was slowly dying inside. I was slowly so being taken apart. So where does the great come in at? I'm about to tell you right now. 
So I went back to being a home health aide and I got the worst cases. I got the, the people, the, the, the perverts that were always trying to grab girls' butts. I'd be like, bing, bing, and they're like, what are you doing here, nigger? Get out of my house, police! And I'm like, I'm back home. And um, sure enough, while I was being a home health aide, I picked up a job being a delivery boy for Pizza Hut. And this is when the magic starts. I was now homeless, living in my Mazda 323, no money whatsoever other than the money that I made from tips, kicked out of a medical program, which I was only three weeks away from graduating. I could not, I was so embarrassed, I was actually thinking of murder. For the first time in my life, the, 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 the demons were beginning to speak to me, and they were telling me, vengeance. Let's kill those people that said lies about you. And after we kill them, let's kill ourselves. And I was like living in the car, scared, because I'm like, this is not how my mother raised me, and I don't want to harm nobody. But sometimes if you put into a corner and you're bullied and pressure and pressure, pressure, it might drive you to insanity. So I went to deliver pizza and I came across this beautiful double car garage. This is how photography started. And um, I opened, the, I ring the bell, and it was one of my boys who used to sell cocaine. And when he saw me with the pizza and the, the pizza outfit, he was like, Johnny, the f excuse my French, what the fuck are you doing when, what are you doing delivering pizza? Aren't you in medicine? And I was like, Yes. He goes, wait, let me guess. You're probably paying your, your medical program uh, loans, right? I'm like, yeah. So he pulls out a wad of money. And I was like, damn. I said, yo, so-and-so, I just started my shift. He's like, nigga, gra grab one of those. And I pulled a $100 bill. I'm like, I ain't got to change. Goes, nigga, keep that, bro. Keep that. When I got in my car, Sean, I looked down, and I started to cry. And I started to say, God, how is it that a year ago I was a you know, A plus, I was about to graduate with a job ready for me, the technicians love me, and now I'm living in my car, homeless. I couldn't tell my dad what had happened, so I put all my stuff in storage. And, you know, one thing about my family is like, I was raised like the, the, the rhinoceros. It's the only animal that doesn't know how to walk backwards. You only move forward. So that's how my mantra was growing up. So the next day I get a call and, uh, my, my, my manager calls and says, Johnny, you did something wrong. You got to come back to the, to, the, to the job. I said, it's not my shift today. He goes, doesn't matter. Someone wants to speak to you. And I advise you not to come to the front. Drive to the back. I'm like, what did I do? He goes, just come back. You'll see. And as I drove by the front, Sean, I could see all nothing but Mercedes Benzes, diamond chains, Rolexes, a whole gang in the front. When I got through the back, I'm like, what, Tony, who's here? He said, Johnny, look on Suffolk Avenue. Look over there. And it was my boy, Danny. And I was like, oh, man. So I was Is like, this the same guy who gave me yeah. the dollars? So I went outside. I said, Yo, Danny, um, you, you, you want your change back? He's like, he's like, nah, nigga. I'm like, you know, did I, did I, did I get to, did you know, like, the pizza was cold? He's like, nah, nigga. I was like, what do you, what do you want? He's like, I want you to come work for me. I'm like, you opening up a pizzeria too? <laughs> He's like, nah, nigga. I want you to come sell that raw with me, nigga, all day. I'm like, you know, Danny, I, that's, that's not my life, bro, you know? This is my new life, pizza, you know what I'm saying? He's like, nah. In school, you was always networking, connecting people, always introducing people to people. I need that on my team. He says, give me a hand. Hold out your hand. I held out my hand, and he, he's, a, he's a big guy, so he grabbed my hand, he put, all these papers in my fingers, in my hands. I was like, I said, Danny, I can't take this, bro. He goes, no, take it. It's a gift from me. Tomorrow when you wake up, I want you to, to think about working for me. If you don't want to work for me, keep the money. But if you decide to work for me, there's a lot more where that came from. I was like, thank you, Ray. thank you, Danny. That money was literally all the money I had. I had no money on me. It was the only money I had. My ex-girlfriend, even though my ex-girlfriend had broken up with me, I swear, I am the best 
ex-boyfriend in the world. Where, All my ex-boyfriend. Where, where exactly does the camera? Because I'm waiting <laughs> to find out where does the camera no, I, come I, in. I had to. I had like, to. I had to, I had to. I had to. I had to make the romance come. I, I, so I my, get so it. We, it, we it, all get it. It actually starts right now. So my ex-girlfriend's mom said, "You know, Johnny, I made your favorite dish: uh, Haitian rice and beans and turkey wings." So why don't you come over and, you know, Melinda's away at, at, at Stony Brook University. And I'm like, awesome. So I go over there and she converted the den, the living room den, into a bedroom. And the food was there, but she said, Johnny, I don't know what you're going through, but tonight you sleep here. And then uh, she closed the door and I began to, like, uh, cry a little bit. And I said, uh, I said, God, you know, I don't know what you want me to do, but tomorrow morning, when I wake up, if you give me one idea, I swear I'll be the best at it. But if tomorrow comes and you give me no idea, I'm going to go roll with my people, you know, in Jesus' name. So the next morning, <laughs> next morning when I woke up and I looked up to the sky, you all may think I'm crazy. I saw a camera turning just like this. Is this in the clouds? In the air, suspended, yeah. really? like a camera, like floating. And I was like, I saw the camera and I went to grab it and my hand went right through it. Did and you ever have any interest in photography before that moment? Well, well, well you know when you ki when you're a kid you sell candy for the school? Mm -hmm. I was always um, saving up enough points and having my mom try to sell all the candy yep. so I can get the most candy so I could buy these little cameras that the flash was this big and you use it, it would die and the next one would die. So I was always like, Photography was, God had implanted it in me from very early. I just didn't know. You but, know? but you weren't a person who would, like, as a kid, you weren't thinking to yourself, when I get to be no. a, an adult, I, I mm. want to be the best photographer no. in the world. I asked God for one idea. And that's what you saw the next yeah. morning you woke up. So I said, I said, God, if you give me one more sign, you want me to be a photographer, just give me one more sign. I'm like trying to listen, I'm like, oh God, talk to me. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't hear no, nothing, no burning bush, but a peace came over me. That's the Holy Spirit. And when I felt that peace, I ran out to tell my friends, I want to be a photographer. Oh, boy, I can't wait. And I got a job working in a warehouse, and a friend of mine gave me a, a book by Anthony Robbins called um, Unlimited Power. And I began to read that book. I, I was living in the car, homeless, with, with, a, with a little flashlight, reading the book in the middle of the night. And I came across a chapter, and this goes to the photography. It said, whatever you're doing right now, stop and envision where you want to be in five years. So here I am with this new job in a factory, still living in a car, delivering pizza and a home health day. And I stopped the button, and I'll never forget, the boss was German. He screamed at the top of his lungs, who stopped the conveyor belt? And I just looked at the wall, and I just saw private jets traveling to Europe traveling to Africa, working with Puffy, working with Jay, meeting a president, hanging out with models, becoming friends with music producers. I mean, I was just fantasizing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he cursed me out. Who told you to turn this off? And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. And I turned the machine back on. Fast forward, in 1997, that same year I was homeless. It, 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 because I want to know the first camera you bought. I actually borrowed a whole, uh, Pentex from my boy Jose Santana. Film? It, um, yes, it was film. Really? So and you I, and it got, and it got film. robbed too. It got stolen. Is that the camera? You know, because before that, obviously, you were not a photographer. Nah. You were not. You know, this was this was a new revelation yeah, that came to you. Yeah, yeah. How long did it take you to get good and really nice with this camera? Well, just and to, mm -hmm, sorry. when 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 you got this camera. I know you had the revelation, you saw it in the sky. Mm -hmm. Now that you physically have it in your hand, mm -hmm. did you say this is it? That, like like that, what I saw in the sky the minute, is real. The minute I saw the camera in the air, I, I feel that I felt the presence of God. And within that same year, homeless, living in a car, 1996, seven, by the end of that year, I made $99,000. Okay, stop there because I want to just back it up because there's so many lessons yep. to be learned and I don't want to go too far yeah, back. Sure. Obviously, sure. you're young sure. and you're told you need to be in special classes. Yep. Somehow you rediscover your birth mother <laughs> and that yeah. gives you 
whatever it is that mm -hmm. you were missing and you go and, and, and become this amazing student mm -hmm. in college, mm -hmm. you know, you have, you, you're going and you're doing well, mm -hmm. then, you know, the, 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 the bottom falls from mm -hmm. under you, yeah. you're homeless, you're living in yeah. your car, yeah. and you pray to God mm -hmm. for a decision to be made on your behalf or yeah. you're going to go hit the streets, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and you see your future, which is a camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Did you know anything about the industry? Because I know you you, no. you you saw all of these different visions. Did you even know that this that this industry existed? Because it's one thing to have a camera, mm -hmm. but now what do I do? I, I honestly, I, I honestly believed that throughout throughout the, the journey that God would navigate me and steer my future. I had no, I had nothing to lose. Okay, so tell me. You know? How did you make your way into the music industry? Well, when, once um, I started, once I was able to save enough money to get a camera, um, I was told that there's a, there was a restaurant called Mecca, and it was a little um, soul food restaurant on the Lower East Side off of Avenue A. And when I was working out of the gym, one of my guys said, yo, Johnny, if you really want to do photography, you should go to Washington Square Park and start practicing with models. And there's a restaurant called Mecca. All the movers and shakers all go, all go, all go there. So if you eat there, um, you'll probably wind up getting some work. So I'll never forget, there used to be a bookstore called, um, not Bowery or Bowl, Bowl Bookstore, some bookstore. I'll never forget, I, I stole a book on photography. And I prayed to God and said, God, I'm sorry I steal this book right now. I just need to learn, and I will, I will return the book back, God. And I learned everything. And I went into Manhattan. I started to meet people on the street. And every pretty girl I saw, I said, excuse me, can I photograph you? Uh, I'm trying to learn how to be a photographer. Back then, I was good looking. I was muscular. What so year is this? Is this 1996? Uh, yeah, 97. 90, okay. Between 96 and 97. Okay. And now, as a reward for allowing them to let me shoot them, I would take them to Mecca. So the general manager, Fahim, saw me and said, Johnny, uh, after, I, after I became friends with him, I, uh, I asked him, you know, I'm a photographer. Maybe one day, I'm giving the short version, I could have my exhibit here. And one day I went there, he said, Johnny, these walls need your photos. How soon can you have an exhibit? Mind you, this is like not even a year into photography. Again, following the Holy Spirit. And then, um, I, I, I didn't know nothing about studio photography. So in the model, in the processing labs back then, they would have all these comp cards to show what you could look like if you hired this photographer. So it was nothing but white female models, white male models, but I saw one comp card with black models and I was like, the, the name said Kwame Bradworth. I'm like, Kwame Bradworth, this must be your brother. So <laughs> I will act like I want to be a model. I'll go to his studio. I'll learn where he positions the lights, and then I could do my photo shoot, and then I'll sell the photos in the restaurant, make money, I'll be rich. And so I meet Kwame in a photo lab. And he's like, yeah, I'll charge you $600. I'll do some photos of you with different clothes. I'm like, where's your, where's your photo studio? Because I don't have a photo studio. I'm like, shit. I'm like, so how do you do your photography? He goes, I rent the studio space from a, a photographer upstairs named Bill Wiley. So I use his space. I said, thank you very much, um, Bradworth. I go take the elevator upstairs. I'm like, I'm like hello, Bill Wally? He goes, yeah, that's me. I'm like, um, my, my good friend uh, Kwame told me that I could rent your space. He's like, well, I really don't rent my space to strangers, but it's $20 an hour and you can rent it. And I called all those girls and all the brothers of mine, friends of mine to become models. I did the photo shoot and within two Within a month, or whatever the month was, before February, maybe January, I finally did an exhibit at Mecca. How, how long was this? Of that same year? Yeah. February, I was done. I had my first exhibit up within the same summer. Is I mean, after the summer, summer homeless. Is this a full year yet? Not even a full year. Wow. And so um, now people are buying my pictures off the wall. So would you consider this to be your first, like, because that, I wanted to get to that. What was your first paying job? Was it, was it this? Was it... The burning of a mortgage for Hope Missionary Church in Central Islip. Uh, it was the burning of the mortgage. 
and it was for $75. I guess like back then, if you were a church, an old, old black like uh, tradition was when you, the, the church was paid off, you get the mortgage and you burn it. So there's never, no one, you can never sell it. It's like, this doesn't exist no more. So when they gave me the $75, Sean, I was like, I'm rich. I'm rich. I really felt like, this is it. Thank you, God. I made $75 just for shooting somebody, you know what I mean? Uh, and I felt like, I'm on the road to the riches now. And um, uh, what, was, what were we just talking about? I don't know, but I got, it, it, let's pick up right Sorry. here, right? Sorry. Yeah. Let, let's pick up right here. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let's pick up right here. Is, <laughs> so is this before the exhibit or? That was like my first job. So before, before, yeah, before the, the exhibit. Yeah. Before the my exhibit. very first job. So you have your exhibit, yeah. right? Talk, talk to us for a second about, you know, because so many people are young in their mm -hmm. chosen professions mm -hmm. and you're going full force at it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Tell me about fear. Where does fear play, play into this? Um, you know, fear, you can't control what, you, what, what anyone's levels of fear are, you know? But, um, you know, growing up the way I was raised, you know, you eat what you kill, you know? So if you move in an accordance with, with, with the movement of the room, if you shift the way you're supposed to, you, won't, you shouldn't have any issues of fear. Now, if something scares you, I pray, mm -hmm. you know? And I, but once I pray and I know that God is with me, I ain't scared, I ain't ever scared, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's so powerful yeah. because so many people, they start out in their careers and they doubt themselves. Mm -hmm. And I love that you have this connection to, to, to God. And I always believe that people, it, it's in, you, you're not going to make it unless you believe in something that's greater than yourself. So I love your connection with God. But, you know, I was asking you about the fear because people, when things don't take off for them right away, they instantly become fearful mm -hmm. and are like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Maybe I better go do something safe. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, I'll go back to that factory or I'll get the job back uh, mm -hmm. delivering pizzas. Yeah. And I'm really glad that, mm -hmm. you know, you felt so connected oh, to, yeah. to, you know, your God that, oh, yeah. hey, this is ordained for me mm -hmm. and let me keep going. If you look at it, Sean, and this is going to sound not disgusting, but I feel that we won the Powerball of life because when you think about it, number one, there was one magical night your mom and dad made eye contact, mm -hmm. and out of billions and billions of sperm, there's one egg right there, and you were the lucky one sperm that made it into the egg. That's the Powerball of life, you it know? Is. And then nine months, you got to go through the, the growth and, and then to be brought into this world, you know? Like, you already won because you made it on this earth. So when I hear people saying, yo, man, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm starving, son. Oh, I got problems. You ain't got problems. You know, we live in a country that gives the individual the opportunity to do what they want if they believe in themselves. You could fall asleep like this guy right here. You know? And, you know, or, or you could be, or you could, or you could stay woke. I'm saying my point is he's up now, he's up now. But that's how I calm people. So if you fall asleep, I'm gonna point you out, sorry. But, um, you know, but let me just tell you real quickly, you know, fast forwarding, because I can put people to sleep. The blessing is that I wound up uh, going to a showcase and a woman named Maria Davis, she was having a showcase. I, Maria, I was Maria. going to every little showcase for artists just starting. And some dude named Jay-Z comes in and does a little performance. Fast forward, I wound up going to a few parties and I wound up meeting Puffy. Stop there. Are you going now shooting? Yeah, and I wound up getting hired to be Jay-Z's per personal photographer, Puffy's personal photographer, Damon Dash's personal photographer, Naomi Campbell's personal stop, photographer, stop, stop, Michael stop. Jordan's you, personal photographer. You, you, didn't, you, didn't origin, you didn't go to Maria Davis's... Um, Just like... In the her, her, her event and, and become Naomi Campbell's um, personal photographer. So I, I want to walk people yep. through yep. the steps. The networking. Because it's, it's, an, it's important because... People 
see the finished product. Mm -hmm. They see, you know, Ronnie Wright, who, who, who's legendary. Mm -hmm. They see Johnny mm -hmm. Nunez, mm -hmm. legendary. Mm -hmm. You're sitting on the stage. Mm -hmm. But it's the journey. Mm -hmm. It is the mm -hmm. roadmap that you guys took to, yeah. to, to, to make your way mm -hmm. to where your name is associated with being legendary. So mm -hmm. you're going to, to the Maria Davis events. Mm -hmm. I remember very well mm -hmm. at Sweetwaters. Yeah. And um, you bump into Jay-Z, Dame Jazz, Dash. This is Kata. before, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Rockefeller Records yeah. becomes what it becomes yeah. now. Yeah. How do you become the personal photographer for Rockefeller Records and Dame Dash? Um, I was shooting every single day. And remember that restaurant I told you about called Mecca? Yep. There was a girl looking really distressed. And I walked over to her and I said, I'm sorry, miss, but um, you look too pretty to be looking sad, you know? And then she smiled and she said, what do, you, what do you do here? I said, these are my photographs. I'm a photographer. I was only like a photographer for like four months, maybe three months, you know? And she's like, wow, I really appreciate that. So after she was done, I said, when you're done with your food, you need a ride, where do you live? She's like, I live in Brooklyn. I'm gonna give you a ride home. She's like, you're, you're an angel. And so I gave that girl a ride and her name happened to be Karen Good. And I'm like, so she's like, I'm the editor-in-chief of photography for a magazine called Vibe Magazine. I want you to come to my office next week. I'm going to introduce you to George and Mimi. Now I have Vibe Magazine on lock, straight up. That's and great. Then that, I met that's Source so Magazine, I had it on lock. And now I was getting paid $85 per photo, per issue. And they were buying like 24 pictures in one magazine. The other one was buying 30 pictures. So now you take 24 and 30, that's 54, 54 times 85. I was out of the car now. Are you still shooting on film at this time? This is before digital. Yeah, still film, still film. What was the landscape like? You paint the picture. How was the competition? Because oh, you're hard. talking, the, it was hard, you know, man. 99, 2000, mm -hmm. 2001. Mm -hmm. What was it? Was it, was it, it a was lot a, of photographers yeah, out there? Yeah, a lot of photographers. Really? I, I don't want to throw nobody under the bus, um, but my boy, I had a friend who had a public access cable show, mm -hmm. and I begged him. I said, listen, I'm trying to be a photographer. If you could just take me to... Um, to, to any of your events, I, I could be your personal photographer. I'll, I'll give you photos for free. He's like, well, next opportunity that comes, I'll see. They had a photographer already, so I had to get rid of that guy somehow, you know? <laughs> so finally I got a chance, and he said, Johnny, tomorrow we're shooting this girl named Erica Badu. She's going to be big. Some group called the Fugees and uh, Drew Hill. I'm like, okay. I waited outside. No one picked me up. The next day... My man JB said, I'm going to take you to, to the city. We go to this party. I'm not, I, you know, I don't want, I'm not throwing nobody in the bus. I'm just keeping it real. Back then I was frolic. I was working out, creatine and all that. We go to the Drew Hill listening party. And it was this song called Somebody Sleeping in My Bed. So I go to that event. And like, that was like the first time I was thrown into the pit with wolves. All these photographers were elbowing each other, pushing each other, you're in my way. And I was like, like, like a little child with a little camera. And out of nowhere, you know, I guess maybe it was, uh, it was just the coolness of the camera. The, the, the singer's like singing, and next thing you know, he's like mushing people out of the way and looking right at my camera. And I'm like, uh oh, I'm gonna shoot this dude. And my boy JV, he's like, yo, Jake, go ahead, get the shot, get the shot. And I'm like, girls like throwing themselves and he's like, get out of the way. And he's like looking at me. I'm like, uh-oh, what's going on here? So I'm, I'm shooting and after the performance is over, somebody goes, hey, the artist wants to meet you. I'm like, uh oh So I was like, I'm like, I'm not going back there. My boy JB's like, yo, Jake, go back there, go back there. This could be the big break. I'm like, break for what, bro? You know what I'm saying? I go back there and... I'm being asked, do I want to hang out? And I'm like, you know what, my girlfriend, we are big fans of yours, so yeah. And he's like, no, no I'm talking about you. You want to hang out? I'm like, well, my girlfriend, <laughs> she's a big fan. So he, after, they got, after the person got the point, um, I was like, now knowing that in order to get these shots, I'm going to have to uh, find the process of elimination. How can I get good shots without ruffling feathers and fighting people? And um, 
You ever heard of a rest, uh, nightclub called the Octagon? Absolutely. It was hard to get in some of these clubs, like the Tunnel. So me and I still worked at Pizza Hut. I was friends with all these, these restaurants. I used to feed the homeless when I was in high school. So I went and borrowed some white clothes, kitchen clothes. And I got two hefty bags. And I bought ice and I put the ice in the hefty bags. I put my camera in the hefty bags and I put my clothes in the hefty bags. And then I would go to the nightclub, whatever nightclub was popping, and I'd go past the line, excuse me, I'm with the bar, I'm with the kitchen. And the bodyguards were like, let him in, let him in, he's at the bar. I'm like, I go right in, go into the bathroom, dump the ice, take off the kitchen clothes, throw them in the garbage, take out the camera, pop open the flash, and it was on and popping. Johnny, can I stop you there? Because this is, oh, okay. no, no, that's nothing. I mean, I had to be a ninja. You had to, you have to, you have you, to figure it out. You just gave such an incredible gem right there because mm -hmm. anybody who has ever climbed to the top of their craft, mm -hmm. you do what it takes. There is no such thing as no for an answer. There's no plan you B. You figure it out. And I love that story Damn. because it showed that, you know, you're not the Johnny Nunez yet, mm -hmm. but you know I got to get that shot. And how can I get into places mm -hmm. that at this point your name doesn't get you in? Mm -hmm. I love that story. So check this out. On 23rd Street and, and uh, Park Avenue, anybody ever goes there or is in that area, a client, mind you, I have my own company, so I only eat when there's food. And a client promised me that they would pay me by a certain day. That day came and I, they said, I won't have no money for you. I had like $20 on me. And I was just boiling because I'm like, I'm gonna have to make this $20 last, you know? And this overweight homeless man comes over to me and he's like, excuse me, I want some money. You have money? And I was about to just scream on this dude. Like, you about to be my punching bag, bro. And I'm like, but you know what? God is in me. So I said, excuse me, before I let him have it. If I give you this money, what will you do with this money? He goes, well, honestly, it's not the money. I just want some food. I said, okay, let's walk this way towards Madison Avenue. There was a subways. And as I was walking angry to get this guy uh, a sandwich, it's almost like when you're auctioning bidding and someone's bidding and then you bid higher and then all of a sudden no one bids higher than you and you're stuck with the bid. That's how I felt. And when I went into the subway, um, I saw people covering their nose and like moving away from the guy. And I was like, you know, that's not nice. You know what I'm saying? So I said, hey, Oscar, Oscar, what, what do you want on that sandwich? As I was online, I said, go, go grab a bag of potato chips and tell the boss that I'll, I'll be a little late. I paid for the food. And I said, oh, Oscar, I'll, I'll catch you later. Because I wanted them to leave with dignity. Mm -hmm. But now, after the sandwich was purchased, I had like maybe $11, maybe, I don't know, $8. And I can remember my, myself telling myself, great, Johnny, we were broke. Now we're even more fucking broke. <laughs> you did great. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I know God will provide. So as I was walking towards the door, angry as hell, my phone rang. And I heard, hello, Mr. Nunes, is this Johnny? I'm like, yes, this is Johnny. I'm like, Johnny, we would like to know how much is your rate per day. I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, being that you might be a new client of mine, um, you tell me. Well, you know, it's three days, maybe four days. Um, can you work all four days? I'm like, yes. Um, you know, who, you know uh, what's the rate? I said, well, you're my new client. Why don't you tell me? How's $8,000 sound? I said, $8,000 per day, Mr. Nunez, per day. I was like, um, hold on one second. I'm like, that's eight times four. Is it, is it? I'm like, take the 24. I'm like, um, yes, I'm available. And who is the client? Uh, Michael Jordan for Nike. No way. I wound up being Michael Jordan's personal photographer for three years, maybe four years. No way. For the brand Michael Jordan Classics. Do you know how they found you? A girl named Teresa saw me always out and about, you know? So the moral of that point is that even in the darkest hour with no money, even though inside my head, myself was cursing myself, I go back to my mother who adopted me. And she always would tell me, you know, God will never forsake you. If you keep your faith in God, watch how he's gonna bless you. 
There's another point I'd love to bring to the Sorry. table because my grandfather used to always tell us, people are always watching. You don't know who's watching you. And you always work and you always do the best job you can because you don't know who's watching mm -hmm. you. Now, the woman who referred you to at that time, I got to believe mm -hmm. Michael Jordan is, mm -hmm. you know, on top of the yeah. world. Had you not been out there doing your thing and working, mm -hmm. you know, at, at the capacity that you were mm -hmm. and, and presenting yourself with, mm -hmm. with class and dignity, that would never have happened. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so important for people to understand. I don't care if you are sitting by yourself, if you think that nobody's watching you, never take the easy way out. You work and you give it 100% all of the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great story. Thank you. Um, was that your eureka moment when you realized, wow, I can do this. I can make a living at, at doing this. Um, I think um, um, the eureka moment was, um, a few months of actually buying a, a camera, I would walk up a, a, a block called 8th Street, which had a lot of shoe stores there. And in that book, Unlimited Power, there was two things I, I learned, self-hypnosis, and the other one was kind of like fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. So I walked, I saw a shoe store called Lucini Shoes. And uh, remember those stomp shoes, the big old mm -hmm. heels, mm -hmm. you know? I was just looking at the window, just wondering like, these are really crazy looking shoes. The general manager came out and he was like, you like the shoes? I'm like, no, <laughs> but I admire the craftsmanship. He goes, what do you do? I said, I'm a photographer. He's like, you're a photographer? Okay, so let me see your business card. I'm like, I just ran out. You have a portfolio? I shipped it out to LA last week, you know? Because, well, you know, give me your number. I may have work for you. Little did I know, he called me the very next week and said, uh, Johnny, I have a fashion shoot. I want you to do a fashion shoot for this magazine called Paper Magazine. We, we have a budget. I'm, I'm still living in a car. I'm like, what's your rate? I'm like, you know what? My rate is whatever you make it. I'm living in a car doing a business deal. How's $7,000 sound? I said, give me one second. I'm like, wow. Yes. The shoot came out so well and made it inside Paper Magazine. And, I'm, and, and I met a new world of friends. And um, the Eureka moment was when they called me for the second shoot. And then I said, wow, that's $14,000. Again, like Mecca, like the photos. All these things were actually happening at the same time. God was like, watch this, bro. Boom. Watch this. Bam. You know, um, you, know you wouldn't believe these stories. And, you know, I just said a minute ago, at the end of that year, I made $99,000, right? There was a, a marketing company and a, a, a very good friend of mine, Stacia Means, she saw me out and about. This is when Wu-Tang was just starting to blow up. And she remembered me and she told me, John, I work at a marketing company and I'm gonna tell them to hire you. So they called me and they said, for every signature that you get, you know, it's gonna be $500. We need you to shoot as many people to sign this signature, a waiver, to let, to let us use their image. I did two jobs. I did one job, $600. I was like, this is awesome. They then told me, Johnny, we're doing a big job at Webster Hall. It's going to be four times that. You got to understand, I'm still I'm moving out of a car now. I get bad news that my friend, another friend that worked in the company who was giving me all the work, he said, I'm leaving this company, Johnny. However, before I leave, I'm gonna tell the company that you are our only photographer. So instead of one or two jobs a month, I go into the company, I don't wanna say the company's name because I can, you know, just to avoid, you know, whatever. Um, and the, the guy gives me a piece of paper, he goes, yo, Johnny, did you see the calendar? I'm like, yeah. He goes, this is a lot of events. This is like an event for three months every single day. But some of them had two. I'm like, but, I don't do all this, I just do hip hop. He goes, oh, no, no, you're doing all of them. Eric said that you're supposed to shoot all of them. By the time I finished shooting three months of events, I get a call from RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company. Mr. Nunez, um, it seems that you've invoiced us for $75,000. Who gave you the, who asked you to shoot all these events? 
And I told him, and it was verified. And Mr. Nunes, we're going to give you two checks. The first one will be uh, $50,000, and then the second check will be for twenty five, dollars and then we will no longer need your services. So by then, you know, by the end of the year, I had like $99,000. Got an apartment. I was actually, I went to live with one of my ex-girlfriend's mom who, lived, who was very old. So I, I rented a room from her. And just so I could be there to cook and, and make sure I, a man was in the house, you know. You're kind of cheap, Johnny. Like you got ninety-nine thousand dollars in the bank. Yo, you, know, you could definitely get your in own apartment. One year. No, no, you know she was so old. <laughs> no, I, I didn't want to move. Apart. I'm just messing with you. She was, all, um, she, was <laughs> sure she was all right. Just really quickly, do yeah. you have any of your old original photos? Yeah. You've kept them all. Yeah, well, as many as I have, yeah, totally. I mean, there was a one time there was a flood in one of the apartments I lived in, and um, some of the, the, the pictures got damaged. But for the most part, the ones that matter, I got them all. You know. Um, we've heard a lot of good. <coughs> Any bad experiences? Bad experiences. Any hmm. artists? Any behind-the-scenes personnel that you know really? I mean, you know, there's a lot of people. That could be cold, you know, not artists in general, just in life, there's people that, that are not doing well or they're not happy internally. So you could do a job for somebody and they're not happy with your work. And to the photographer, it, it could hurt, but I, I didn't create your face. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got to take that up with the man. You got to take that up with God. So, but you know, honestly, even when bad things happen or negative energy comes my way, I pray that whatever they're going through, it gets corrected. And um, remember Guru, the rapper Guru? Absolutely, gangsta. He wanted me to give him every photo I ever took of him. And I'm like, all right, I'll try my best. You know what I'm saying? And one day he got really nasty with me at at the uh, uh, some hotel off on 41st Street, the Bryant Park Hotel. He he kind of like chased me with like two or three people, and thank God I had no fear though. I was like I was like I would like to see I would like to see what two or three guys you know want to bring it. That's how I really felt at the time. Thank God he didn't. But um, you know he got in my face. A few friends got in the middle. And a few months later, he came back to me and he said, Johnny, can I talk to you? And I was like, what happened to this mean, nasty dude that was talking shit? He said, I want to apologize for my actions the other day. I, it was, it was, I'm a man, you're a man. I need to respect you like a man. Can you forgive me? I'm like, of course, guru, you know what I'm saying? And then a few, day, a few weeks later, he passed away. Oh. You know what I'm saying? But again, you don't know what someone's going through. Um, I mean, that's no excuse for people to treat other people bad, you know what I'm saying? But again, you know, before I leave my house now, I pray over my son and daughter. I pray over my wife. I pray over my family. I, I don't leave that house with asking God to order my steps because we're living in a world, and no disrespect to anybody, where people are so confused. And if you even say one word about something that other people don't like, you're considered bad. You got people doing this, you got people doing that, and if you speak on it, you're considered bad. So we're in a time where we got, look what we got in the White House, you know what I'm saying? Before we get political. Yeah, sorry about that. You know, <laughs> before we get political, and I want to go there because I know you were um, part of the Obama administration yeah. and yeah. you did some things with, with that president, that which I think is amazing. Yeah. Um, just really quick, yeah. rapid mm -hmm. fire question. Yeah. Um, were there any shots mm -hmm. that you ever took mm -hmm. that never were released, never printed? And if mm -hmm. so, why? Wow, that's a good question. Um, well, uh, I mean, I can't tell you who the artist is, but there's been times where I've photographed an attempted homicide. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I Did you know in real time you were photographing it? No. You, you ever see... Um, Where's Waldo? Where yeah. you, you don't know what's going on. Whenever a fight breaks out, and you know we've been through a lot of fights, mm -hmm. gunshots, everything, I usually take my camera out and I flicker the flash. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was going to shoot until I processed the film. So 
in essence, um, uh, an individual did have a gun, and uh, 5-0, uh, the district attorney came to me and uh, asked me, Mr. Nunez, uh, I was like, how the hell did this guy knows me? Because my records were at this uh, photo lab called Adorama. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they knew where I was. And then we need those photos of this individual. And luckily, I'm so stupid that I didn't know the, the artist's name, you know? So I'm like, oh, that roll of film. You know what? I opened up the camera and overexposed it. I threw it out. And the, the, he gave me the card. Because, Mr. Nunez, if by any chance you find that card, that roll of film you lost, um, give it me a call, you know? I'm like, you got it. So, of course, I never showed that picture to nobody. Would you catch on it? I'm sorry? What did you catch on well, that I roll asked, of film? Well, I asked, the, I asked the, uh, the district attorney, by the way, how did you know I had that photo? Because, Mr. Nunez, when your camera was flashing, I white, I, black and white, uh, surveillance cameras, if too much light was on something, it would whitewash, like complete white. The flash that I shot was just enough flashes so that when the gun was put down, the light was done. But the photos have the photo of the actual the attempted artist. homicide. Okay, yeah. Is it the artist with a, with a gun? Yeah. Is it the actual artist himself? Yeah, you're about to blow somebody away. Um, did you ever let the artist know? No. And I was going to tell them, because, um, you know, I was thinking about college money for my kids and all, and a house. <laughs> but he's too much of a friend and too much of an awesome person. And, um, and you know, I, 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 I think the, the keeping silent is, is why I am who I am, why people trust me. Yep. And I don't even have to say the person's name. But the good news is that later on, People, I find out, are selling my photos, and they're making millions of dollars, you know? Uh, there's a picture of, uh, in DJ Khaled's living room of Jay-Z and Nas toasting that sold for half a million dollars. And, and I, w I want to talk about that because, huh? you know, your photos... Mm -hmm. um, Came around with a pink phone and a fur hat. That made, I mean, him, your, that made him $10 phone? million. Dollars. How about that? Wow. You, 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 Floor mats. You work with curtains. Wire Image mm -hmm. and Getty yeah. um, Images. Yeah. How did that come to be? I'm going to be honest with you all. Um, at the, the time. And, and, and if you can explain yeah. Yeah. what that means from a photography point of view, yeah. because that, that is so, a, yeah. an amazing so, accolade. So what happened was when film, when digital cameras came out, film was like, like prehistoric. And I would say half of the black and Latino photography workforce cut. It's either you learn digital or you're done. So I began to see white photographers in the middle of black events. The only time you'd see white photographers in hip hop events was like the feds. But I started to see more and more spring up. And I told my agent at the time, a girl named Kim Fon, who's still to this day my best, one of my best friends, I said, Kim, man, I can't, I can't stand this. All these racist white photographers are coming into and moving into hip hop. They're just taking over. They don't know nothing about the culture. She said, Johnny, why are you mad? I said, because this is uh, hip hop. You know, you, you have no business taking all the money, being ignorant as I was at the moment. She said, Johnny, let me, let me ask you a question. Um, if you meet the owner of the company and they offer you an opportunity, would you go? I'm like, yeah. So y'all gonna laugh, but she invites me to an all Asian party. And it was in little Korea. The door opened up and there was Japanese people, Taiwanese people, Cambodian people, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, you name it, they were all there. And when the door opened, she said, hey everybody, this is my boy Johnny, he's one quarter Chinese. They're like, what up, yo? And I was like, he, she introduces me to a guy named Josh Tang, who happened to be Chinese American. And he said to me, Johnny, we could do three things. We could date, we could engage, or we could get married. What do you want to do? I said, well, let's start with dating first. What does that mean? He goes, I give you a camera, and if I can't make you what you make in one month, in one week, you give me the camera and you keep doing what you're doing. But however, if in one month I can make you what you make in four or five months, you stay with me. So I became a partner and a, 
a, a, a grandfather contributor to Wire. Wow. And uh, so if a pitch sold 400, I got 50, they got 50, and I own my rights. To this day, wow. I own my rights. Wow. So, Congratulations. Thank you. And then when they sold in 2007 to Getty for $270 million, I bought shares, praise the Lord. And um, I became a grandfather contributor to Getty Images. Wow, same so, deal? Yeah, all day. Wow. Hello. Thank you. Johnny, you ain't doing bad. Oh, no, it gets better. <laughs> it gets better because, you know, again, when I saw that camera in the sky, living, you know, I was at my ex-girlfriend's house, but I was still with no money in the bank, fear for a second of doing some bad things to people and eventually taking my own life. I had no, I had no fear. Fear was now me, because I, I wanted to bring fear and, and hurt people. But again, my mom and my dad who adopted me, they gave me the Christian values to know that um, you have an issue, pray. Get on your knees, put your face to the ground, palms up, and ask God for what you want. Humility, patience, and to bless your enemies. That's hard to forgive people, I, you know? But I learned that, you know, there's blessings in forgiveness, and there's also blessings in just helping people. You know, people, I, have, I, I know I go places and there's photographers that can't probably stand me, you know what, at the end of the night, I'm gonna pray for you. And then all of a sudden, a new, a new job comes up, you know? Correct. You know, I don't, I don't, all my successes, working for the Obamas, going on a second- yeah, can, we, can we talk about that? Because yeah. 1997 mm -hmm. is kind of when it all took off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost 20 years mm -hmm. to, to, to the year in 2016, mm -hmm. and I wanna read this. Mm -hmm. You were appointed um, mm -hmm. a mentor artist with Turnaround Arts, yeah, turn around, a yeah, public-private yeah, yeah. partnership yeah. started by the Obama yeah. Foundation, mm -hmm. the Obama White yeah. House, mm -hmm. and it was led by the um, JFK Center for Performing Arts. Yeah. Tell us about that. So it's a funny story. Um, my my mother-in-law, uh, she's a she's a, a church lady to the fullest degree, and and uh, she's very um, old fashioned, and she likes to debate. And she says to me, you know, Johnny, you know, Puff Daddy, and you know all these Jennifer Lopez's, and you can't even get your own son and daughter in the White House to do the egg roll. And I'm like, what? She's like, and my wife's like, Johnny, there's this thing called the egg roll. It's on the great lawn of the White House. All the kids and, and all the like the nobility, all the who's who's children go on the white uh, on, go on the, the 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 White House's lawn, and they have a contest where you take a spatula and you roll an egg to the finish line. Whoever you know rolls the egg, I'm like, so that's the egg roll, yeah. And my mother-in-law's like, you know people, you should have all of us in the White House. I'm like, I told my wife. I don't know anybody in the White House, but I did. So I wound up making a few phone calls, and um, I managed to get um, my kids on the lawn, and my son won the egg roll, and I was like, yay, you know? And then uh, fast forward, I met Mo Owens, who was the uh, assistant secretary of the White House through uh, Belisha Butterfield, who's a very dear friend of mine, probably yours too. If anybody knows Belisha Butterfield, and I went to the White House to shoot Obama for an event. And uh, i never forget Mo Owens, like Navy SEAL kind of a brother, but, but mad Bronx. humble. Yeah, from the Bronx, he played ball. And he worked for several presidents from the Bush family to the Obamas, all the terms. And uh, I saw him at Swiss Beats' No Commission during Art Basel, and I shot him with Noriega. And so then I thought to myself, when my mom, my mother-in-law started to talk more junk about why can't you get our ch children in the White House again, you know? I'm like, give me one second. So I called Mo Owens, because I remember I had his number, and he said, Johnny, come. So he got me on, he got us in the White House again, and then uh, he said, John, why don't you meet me upstairs in the W Hotel bar, let's have a talk. And I went up to the, to the W bar, whatever you call it, and I said, Mo, I want to say thank you. He said, Johnny, wh why, why, um, why haven't you ever shot for the White House? I'm like, Psh. How can I shoot for the White House? I mean, you got to know somebody. Uh, I've heard stories about the, the White House photographers. I know who they kind of hire. They don't really hire. Cause no, that's not true. You know, it's funny. We're about to go on a second historical trip to Cuba. Why don't you uh, come and maybe I could talk to them. I don't know if they got a photographer. Maybe you can come and become a photographer. I'm like, yo, I would love to be your photographer because let me talk to them. Fast forward the story. He 
spoke to them about me and they read my story. Article about my life in the New York Times, started out in a car, now I'm shooting with all the celebrities, from LeBron James' personal photographer to, to Beyonce's personal photographer, and they want to meet you. So when I met them, they said, Johnny, we not only want to have you come and shoot, we really want you to be an ambassador to the arts and humanities and be a diplomat on behalf of America to the Cuban uh, amazing, country. Johnny. So, but here, check it out. I go to Miami and I, I got my clothes on. My boy Carlos Campos made me a brand new uh, suit. And I'm in, I go into my room and there's like a little card with a basket of food, champagne, a gift from the White House with Michelle Obama's uh, signature. I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. I call my mother-in-law, my, my wife, I call everybody, look at this, I can't believe it. And um, they said dinner will be ready in a little while so you don't have to come downstairs. So I go downstairs to this table and all like government officials are there. And I'm looking at the table for my name. You're like the, cause there's names by each chair, you know, for the people that are gonna eat. And I noticed my name wasn't there. So I was like, uh oh, uh, I said, excuse me. And before I could speak, the person says, you Johnny News? I'm like, yeah, you're the photographer, right? Oh, you, you gotta sit over there. I'm like, wait a minute, I thought I was gonna be an ambassador. Oh no, if your name ain't on the table, then you pretty much are the photographer. I'm like, you know what, let me go back to my room and get my camera. I go up to my room, I get the camera, I'm like, it was too good to be true. It was too good to be true, I knew it. And I go and I sit down on the side. And uh, I'll never forget um, when Kathy and uh, another lady, lady came and they saw me sitting there, they said, Johnny Nunes? I'm like, yeah, I'm your photographer. She goes, Oh, no, 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 we already got a photographer. You come over here. I'm like, yeah, but there's no car with my name in it. She had put her name over my name so that no one could take the seat. Oh. And I was dead in the center with all the elected officials and all the Turnaround Arts members. And I, I was trying not to cry. I was trying to keep my composure as they were explaining that this is going to be a historical trip to Cuba. We represent the White House. We represent Obama and Michelle. And it was at that very moment that I was like, God, you, 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 you bless me too much, you know? And then later on, we are, me and Sean are hanging out in this penthouse with all the, I, I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna get you to be a turn on artist. Watch, I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna talk to them today, uh, this week. Yeah, man. So Question for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I always wanted to notice, you've taken so many pictures mm -hmm. over your career. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite? Oh man, um, uh, it's not really a photo. It is a photo, excuse me. I shot Jay and Beyonce's first date when they came to, uh, to Damon Dash's birthday party. So I got like the first photo of two of them officially dating. Really? And so fast forward years later, the New York Times wrote a two page article about my life and uh, I was in LA at the, at the Four Seasons Hotel, and I'll never forget grabbing the newspaper and looking for it, and I finally found it. So I had to fly to Las Vegas the next day to Las Vegas because there was a Rock, Rock, Rock Away hired me, Jay-Z's company, Dame Dash's company hired me to shoot their fashion dinner. And just as I was, um, it was actually the same day I flew out, sorry. So Jay-Z gets up and he says, everybody, before we start, uh, I want to, uh, you know, I want everybody to give a round of applause to my photographer, Johnny Nunez. And he had a cigar in his hand. And Beyonce was clapping, he was clapping, and everybody was sitting just like y'all. He goes, let's try this again. Everybody give it up to my photographer, Johnny Nunez. And, and everybody stood up and started clapping. And I started shooting that photo. And then um, that week or so, I went, I got home, and there was a shipment, a diamond watch you know, sent to me Beautiful. as a gift. I, of course, gave it to my wife and said, hide that, you know. <laughs> and so she put it away. Jamel Stewart, uh, Jamel, uh, Jamel gave me it. Jamel Spencer. This is not bad for a guy who was adopted, mm -hmm. living in his car, mm -hmm. put in special ed classes. Mm -hmm. Can you name you named a lot of A-list celebrities. Mm -hmm. 
off the top of your head, can you run down some of the, you know, A-list celebrities that you have, have not only been in the presence of, mm -hmm. but shot for? Yeah, uh, Rihanna, very dear friend of mine. I met her when she was 14. God bless the dead. Mark Ronson introduced me to Amy Winehouse. Um, Nas, Jay Puff. Uh, sadly, the week I was supposed to shoot Biggie, he was gun the day I got I got hit by a car. I got I got I got into a car accident. Excuse me, and that was March 9th, the day Biggie was killed, and I was supposed to shoot him that week. And um, oh, oh, back to the people. Um, the 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 Clintons. Uh, Michael Jordan and LeBron James. But when I say these names, they're actually my friends. Spike Lee, Lee Daniels, um, Russell Simmons, Kamali Simmons. Um, you know, there's so many. Sean Prez, everybody, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget, I sh he had a birthday party in a nightclub lounge. And um, so many celebrities came and Sean was running a little late. But I still stayed there, and when he got there, I was just so happy. Like, he is the same Sean then as he is now. Like myself, loves and enjoys helping people. You know, he started Global Spin Awards. Now, that, that junk, he fights people from like Malaysia, Alaska, DJs you never heard of. They, they are getting honored and recognized. I remember there was a guy named uh, DJ Khaled, some dude, you know. Sean was like, hey, I want to give a shout out. I want to give an honor to this DJ named DJ Khaled. Who would have thought? J J Johnny, you do realize this is your interview. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry. You know, we're going to wrap things up mm -hmm. here. And um, I really want you to think about these questions mm -hmm. before we conclude. Because I think it's important for anybody who's in this room and also for anybody who watches this mm -hmm. um, in the future. What's the best advice you ever got? <clears throat> the best advice I ever got, I would say, is pray and always keep faith in God. That's the best advice that my mom gave me when I was, I still remember. And uh, that's, that's, the, that's the best advice I give everybody. Um, if you don't believe in God, you know, it's okay, but I could, just say I'm living proof. If you extend or if you put one foot towards God, he will move and, and, and he will open doors for you, doors that we can't see, you know? What's the worst advice you ever got? Uh, worst advice? There's actually a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, worst advice was, I have to say, I don't know if it's really advice, but trusting in people that come across nice and they're not nice. They actually rob. There was a guy named Mark, Mark Koch. He claims to be an evangelist. He tells people he's made movies. He did make one movie, but then he, he tells them, I'm gonna make you a movie producer. And he gets the money and then he dips. He writes books on Christianity gives talks, his name is Mark Koch, son's a famous car driver too. And I, had n I never saw that one coming. I had no idea this man was a crook. Not only was he a thief, he still does it. And he knows the law, so he shifts. So the best, the worst advice I ever got was trusting someone who, who uses God to, to steal wow. from people. Wow. Does, does that make sense? You gotta, be, you gotta be careful who you invest with. Because just because they're nice and they might have a nice car, they might rent a Sprinter and everybody get in and, and, and he orders food for everybody, you don't know their intentions might not be with God. Their intentions might be, how am I going to rob every one of these people and count the money before they know the money's gone? Johnny, I love you. <laughs> Give it up for Johnny Newman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.